Hey guys, it's Vince. Today in this video, we're going to be doing a breakdown of a website called PrintNC Wiki, which is apparently going to try to uh, break down CNC information on one website. Uh, you can see over here on the left side, he's got a whole bunch of topics that he's covering. And I was directed to this site because there were some questions coming up from a potential client, and he directed me to it saying, this is what this site is saying. What do you think? Well, I'm going to cover what I think because it's kind of frightening on what's being actually displayed here. And I can tell you that what's happening here is what's happening all over the Internet in terms of forum use is that people review forums and typically take what they found on forums and they disseminate it on a website. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. And I'm going to prove it. Um, with some information I'm about to provide. So first and foremost, let's discuss a topic that's very close to my heart. Um, and I'm going to show you how close this is before we even get started. You can see this person used my cable. There's my uh, DS flexion. You can see automation right here. And you can see the MBR rating on the cable, which is right here, which is actually what he's covering on this topic point. Um, here's where we're going to discuss some things that keeps coming up. And I think there's a misconception with electricity as far as going from 110 or 120 volt to 220 volt where we become more efficient when we're using a spindle that's rated at 120 or 220. So what we're going to discuss here is VFD to spindle, the cable size that should be used from the VFD to power your spindle motor. Now I've done a video last week where a vendor was deciding to use 18 gauge cable to actually sell to power spindle motors. Now guys, again, let's cover the basics so everyone's on the same page and there is no more confusion because again, a website like this where he's just breaking down, you know, he says here 2.2 uh, kilowatt, 120 volt spindle uses 16 gauge cable. That is correct. What he forgot to put here is all the details of the cable regarding heat and I'm going to discuss that detail and why it's so important. When we come over here, he's got 2.2 kilowatt, once again, 2200 watt spindle running at 220 volts. So for my guys out there in novice, that means that this spindle is more efficient, actually twice as efficient as the first one because it doubles the voltage. And the spindle uses 18 gauge cable. Now my electrical guys out there are probably shaking their head. And I'm shaking my head because it doesn't matter how familiar most of you are. You understand that a lower number under the AWG rating means that the cable is thicker. You can see that right here. The leads inside the cable have a greater diameter, 1.5 millimeter on 16 gauge versus 0.75 millimeter on 18 gauge. That means that this cable is more efficient in transferring electricity and dissipating heat. Okay, now when we go smaller because he feels that you're running a higher voltage, which means it lowers the amp rating. Let me explain for my novice guys out there. If a 2.2K spindle, this VFD is running a maximum of 20 amp output, then a 220 volt spindle VFD uh, will be running at max output 10 amps because it's more efficient. It's double the voltage. The issue is, is that when you double the voltage, and even though your amps are becoming more efficient, your heat is symmetrical to the amps. So that means that at 20 amps at 120, your heat is just as symmetrical as 220 at 10 amps. The issue resolves around when we drop our cable size, there's the potential to overheat that cable much sooner because, again, you're running 18 gauge leads. That means there's less copper. Hopefully he's using copper. But if there's less copper, there's more heat and that puts more stress on your casing. Therefore, in electrical, in general practice, best practice that is, you always go above the negative rating, meaning above what's known as subpar. You would never stay at the bare minimum. You'd always stay above. So in that case, 16 gauge is what would be required. And it should not be dropped if you go to 220, okay? So let's cover that in detail. Like I said, this is extremely important to understand. And you can see this person decided to do that with the 1.5 kilowatt or 1500 watt spindle as well. He gives you this crap too, and it's crap. Okay. He also discusses shielding grounds needs to be terminated to both VFD and spindle. Well, this is a debate that's been going on for quite some time. And uh, again, I want to cover some things that many people out there because I get this argument a lot and here's what my argument back is and I want you guys to see this first of all there's a company in Germany 
for those of you not familiar, is called Lutz VFD Cables. Now, they make some of the most premier cables in the industry in commercial use. Now, this company is a German company. And if we read this paragraph down, it says most VFD cables use a dual layer combination of foil and braid shields. Other VFD cables may use a single layer overlapping copper tape shield, which is not as flexible. In either case, the shield is designed to capture noise and power distortions created by pulse width modulations inside the VFD. Well, we all understand that, and that's what I basically have preached on my channel since day one. Um, the foil and braid design has the advantage of better cable flexibility and yields a smaller cable bending radius for tight installations. Once again, why I selected it. Regardless of which shielding system is used, the shield should be grounded to provide a low resistance path to ground so that electrical noise can be drained. Now, here's where it gets different. If the shield is not properly terminated, the electrical noise that is captured by the shielding system is not able to drain and, cause, and can cause a system malfunction. Unlike signaling technology, listen closely, in which the shield is only to be terminated on the source end, it is recommended for the shield of the VFD cable and power circuits to be terminated on both ends, the cabinet and the motor side. But yet, now I want you guys, I highlighted this because I want you to see this, and I'm going to show you something that's interesting. If the VFD manual recommends something different, the VFD manufacturer instructions must be followed. Interesting. Interesting, and this is what I bring up to all those guys out there who are new age, nuances, and want to differentiate from signal cables, and they, they split hairs, oh, well, this is a VFD cable, and we can set uh, you know, electrical energy back to the stator on the motor and potentially damage a bearing in the motor. Guys, let me tell you what. Show me one. Show me a spindle motor damaged from EMI. I've never seen it. It's not on Google. You know why I know it's not? I did a data scrape. It's not on Google doesn't exist. That's the first rule. The second rule is this. You remember this, this sentence right here? If the VFD manual recommends something different, the VFD manufacturer's instructions must be followed. Let's look at this. Okay. I did a whole breakdown on the user's manual overview from HY, which is the basically the largest, most consumable civilian-based VFD being used right now. You don't believe me, you can go on Amazon, check out the stats on sales. The grounding process right here, and you can see it's highlighted. I'm going to cover just a brief section of this video I made, and you can see it's made in January 25th of 2020, so it's been on uh, YouTube for quite some time. It states, uh, 220, 380 volt, third grounding method, grounding resistance should be uh, 100 ohms or lower. 380 volt, special grounding method, grounding resistance should be 10 ohms or lower. But as we come down, it says the grounding method for several inverters together should be done as the first and second diagrams below. I'm going to hit play here and let myself, at this point in time, discuss what this user's manual states. And when I hear guys say that it's not covered in the manual, um, it, that's really frustrating because I know every manual discusses grounding. And I know you may not understand it fully, but... You should get something out of this because you can see how well written this is here. Grounding, uh, grounding terminal E. Be sure to correct ground. Or, or excuse me. Be sure they put correct grounding uh, to make correct grounding. Um, Two twenty volt class. The third grounding method. Grounding resistance should be one hundred ohms or lower. Uh, Three eighty volt class. The special third grounding method. Grounding resistance should be ten or lower. Now, again, on the ohms, I've already covered that in previous videos. I recommend three or under. Um, if you're doing everything right, that should be really easy to attain using a quality meter. I would go through and double check that on your system. The entire system I cannot emphasize that enough. Should be a three ohms or lower. And I know there are certain systems out there that do not have components in areas that are meeting metal to metal, whether it be conductive. If you're using um, bearings that are those roller plastic bearings on systems, again, um, on different machines, if it's not conductive, it's not going to ground through conduction on the remaining components if they're metal if they're not making metal to metal contact. So you'll have to go through the entire system and validate those specific areas that you're three ohms or lower, okay? If you guys have questions on that, you can check out my previous videos. I've done that. I'll put a link in the description at the bottom so you can check them out as well. Choose grounding wires according to the basic length and size and technical requirements of the electric equipment, okay? Uh, do avoid sharing grounding wire with other large power equipment such as electric welder, power machine, etc. The grounding wire should be kept away from the power supply wires 
the large power equipment. Um, again, this is interesting because if you're using a ground rod, it really it's irrelevant as far as what it's actually shared with. I've yet to see an issue with that. Um, again, this is more their interpretation on that perspective, but here is something we all need to realize. The grounding method for several inverters together should be done as the first and second diagrams. Now, they're saying for several inverters, in your case, many of you are only running one inverter. In that case, or one system. It's still going to be the same. Uh, should be done as the first and second diagrams below. And we'll come over here. Avoid the third loop, okay? And that's just meaning a ground loop. And I get asked about this topic all the time. This right here is illustrated in the user's manual on page 13. Once again, I told you I'm on page 13. And you can see what we've got here. We've got a terminal here, a terminal here, and a terminal here. All three are coming back to one central grounding point. This is known as a star point ground system. Okay? You see they have good. <laughs> so, very basic. I've gotten asked about this topic numerous times. You can see here, this is explained. I mean, it's pretty much self-explanatory from what you're looking at. As we go to the next one, this is known as a daisy chain method. Okay, I've gotten asked about this. Guys do this with drives all the time. And when you're doing anything with power, this is not acceptable. They say it's acceptable because it's a ground method, and that's fine. It is acceptable in a ground method. I don't recommend it. This is best practice, but this will work, meaning there's one ground location, and then it goes from the ground right here, transfers over to this conductor, transfers over here, and therefore you've got a good ground. This, however is not a good ground this is con now this is a ground loop gentlemen this would lead to potential of causing problems and that's why we do not do it now whether or not you want to take someone else's uh advice that's fine i want to just point out some things even when i said this back when i created this video i'm going to hit play and i wanted you to hear what i said considered a ground loop you can see what I've got illustrated here, lead attached twice. So we have the ground right here. This would be a ground rod, for instance. And then we're feeding off to our equipment. And you can see we have a lead coming in, lead coming in, lead coming in, and then another lead coming all the way back. That leaves the area open for differential and voltage potential, which could lead to a possible ground loop. I've gotten questions about guys reading um, more modern type literature on BFD cables where they're saying now to ground both ends. And again, I always answer that question the same way. You guys have to make the assessment of what to do with your system. I'm not there with you, but here's the way I look at it, and I've done this for years. If the information has been the same for years, where it's been one end of the cable gets grounded as far as the shield drain to prevent the ground loop. I don't believe in changing that because if I change that, I leave myself open for the potential of a ground loop. To me, I'd rather not have the potential of a ground loop and see if I'm fine. If I find that I'm not fine, I could always ground the opposite end. I do not recommend that, and I will say that again. I do not recommend that over. Now, that I've said all this. And I've said it back even in January 25th of 2020. This was when this video was published. I want to show you guys something else that I feel is definitive evidence. This is my eBay store. And in my eBay store, I sell a lot of spindle cables. Here are my spindle cable listings. But rather than tell you what I sell, I'm going to give you a taste of exactly how many I sell. On my 10-foot standard spindle cable, I've sold 332. That's just that model spindle cable. My other standard 20-foot spindle cable, 426. I'm going to keep going. Just a couple. We'll go 20-foot on my DS Flexion, 383 sold. These were just released too, gentlemen. Uh, look at this. Here's my assembled spindle cables, 64 sold. I'm going to keep going. 15-foot standard spindle cable, 72. You guys can do the math with this. I'm just going to keep going. You saw all the listings. Here we go. Another assembled 10-foot, 37 sold. I'm going to keep going. This will be the last one. 15-foot DS flexion, 49 sold. Just do the quick math on that, okay? 
So we can honestly say I've sold well over a thousand. If we come all the way down here, well, probably closer to 1400, 1500. That's just through eBay. That's not through direct invoice through PayPal. Now, I want to show you something else. We know eBay is an unbiased site in as far as feedback. I'll go in my store, 100% feedback, 7,800 items sold, 7,800 items sold, 1,300 followers. So when we look at these stats, and this is an open realm where feedback is not manipulated, it's open to the general public, you have to think in terms of logic that I've sold well over 1,300 spindle cables just through eBay, not including direct invoice through PayPal, and I've never had anyone ever say, you know what, I only grounded the spindle cable at one end, and it's not working. Because it would be reflected in my feedback, gentlemen. Think about it. Really interesting is when we break it all down, and we could say this, you know, time time again, HY in her own user's manual doesn't reflect it. Now, how many guys are using HY spindles and VFDs, and how many guys have damaged a spindle motor that you've read on a form because of EMI? No, what we read on forums is they damage them because they burn them up because of incorrect programming or incorrect hookup in terms of power leads. How do I know this? This is not my first rodeo, and after about 20 years online doing this, I can tell you that's what does it, and we all know it. So whatever you choose to do and ground your system with, that is your business. I'm telling you my business as a vendor and seeing this, I want you guys to be on the right page. And I hope many of you stay with me for this video because it is getting a little longer, but with good reason. Let me come over here. This is where things get really interesting, where this individual discusses and shows pictures again of enclosures that are built. And we can see here we have a VFD installed inside the enclosure, definitive no-no, right by his power supply, which this is just a mass production of EMI. And as we scroll down, he discusses EMI. This is where it gets comical. Keep distance between noisy and sensitive parts. Well, guys, this is an HYVFD. And then as we come up here on this system, in best practice, you do not install a VFD in close proximity. As a matter of fact, he says it again. Separate noisy parts from sensitive parts. See EMI. Here's his EMI part. And here's the problem what we're seeing. We can see last edited by. And as you go through this site, you'll see these little quotes of whoever is touching these excerpts as far as information. We have no idea who this person is. None. But one thing I can tell you is they link a lot to Amazon to buy parts from and do all that. And, you know, as we go through all of this, you can definitively see what we're looking at. This is basically a promotion. They're trying to get you to feel that you're safe in listening to them to build your system. And I'm telling you guys, be careful. Be careful with what you're doing and be careful on what you're working with because, again, as you see this stuff, you will see there are some serious, serious issues. Matter of fact, um, you could see he covers everything from cable insides, the enclosure, uh, the enclosure. This is interesting. Inside the enclosure, you can use solid wire. Otherwise, you often would need for rules. He's right. You would need for rules. Do you know why no one uses solid wire inside an enclosure, guys? For those of you guys out there who have not worked with solid wire, it is basically used in stagnant situations where manipulation is not required, like your breaker box. Once it's put, it's done. These installations, you may have to go back in and modify. I do not recommend using solid wire. Okay? And again... All of your wiring should be shielded when it comes to motors. If we look up here, now whether you're selling a system or buying information or listening to information, I guess that's the best way to put it. Let's look at who we have here. We have somebody that's obviously, if you click on his purchasing area, buying and assembling kits and tools. I mean, you can see here it's all a ploy to go over to a store. And then when we come down here, and this is where it really gets interesting to see what kind of knowledge base this person has. Because, again, last edited by, there's just numerous people. This is last edited in October 9th of 2022, so the website's new. If you come over here to troubleshooting, there's like two or three excerpts on troubleshooting. We know that most of the forums are dictated around troubleshooting. So if you really understood... C and C. Why not have a giant troubleshooting section? That's what I deal with mostly on on potential client systems. Is how do I do this? How do I do that? What do I do with the software? What do I do? 
None of that. You've got like one or two paragraphs. So look at what I'm telling you. Be very careful in the way you proceed to move because I'm telling you right now, there is a lot of misinformation out there and it is terrifying. This stuff is amazing. Now, I will, not, I will say this. There are certain instances that are on this site like his diagrams and that, they're probably dead on. And the reason these are dead on, and we have to look at this logically, is he looks at the wiring diagram that came with the board or what's already posted online and just regurgitates the information to you. That's why most of this stuff you can't get wrong. What usually you get wrong is when you start making electrical calls and you have no understanding of what you're discussing. And there's no actual facts to what you're discussing other than what he found online and tries to basically regurgitate information. So, again... Be careful, guys. Think about what you're doing. Be careful of sites like this. They are just popping up. As a matter of fact, we go to this site and try to find out who's posting on it. You can't find anything. The only thing you can find is when you go to the home page, you can see last edited 12-19-2021. So this is all the same stuff that many of you find in my novice guys. These are what they land on. Please be careful. If you're not certain, ask the right questions. And always, always, always double check everything. Double check the information from me. I give you the sources. Do your homework. Put the time in if you're serious. If not, you're going to buy. I tell my, my potential clients all the time, if this guy sold you on this site because he put this together, then I don't know what you did to really check what he's saying. If you're doing no, no due diligence yourself, anybody can say anything and you'll buy it. And that's the problem. Don't find me after a problem. Try to find me and research this stuff before. And then if I earned your business by the fact that I'm being totally transparent and obviously I have a skill set in this field, again, I'm not around since, you know, 2022. You can check the eBay store, see how long I've been doing this. This is a long time, gentlemen. So just be careful. Take care.